Welcome to Self Helpful. I'm your guide, Kevin Miller, and I curate the sea of new personal development messages to bring the most influential leaders onto this show. Join me as I question my guests to better understand their counsel so we can all integrate the wisdom into our lives because we all want to elevate our own experience and improve the way we show up for others. The Self-Helpful Podcast is presented by Ziggler, your premier source for equipping coaches. Visit Ziggler.com. Hello, self-helpful listeners. In this episode, how to interrupt the loop of your natural self-unawareness. This is part three in our series on emotional intelligence. A primary point is the foundation of emotional intelligence. It's not about being in tune with others' emotions, but your own. That's the core. My muse here has been Scott Allender, author of the book, the Enneagram of Emotional Intelligence, a journey to personal and professional success. He's also host of the Evolving Leader podcast. Now, in this show, I brought on a mentor of Scott's who actually introduced us, Ian Morgan Cron. Ian is a renowned executive coach and Enneagram expert, and just a guy with radical insight into the human psyche. He is his own guinea pig, in essence, for self-awareness. And we go down the rabbit hole of discussing this loop of self-unawareness that we all fall into every day. Him too. He's just gotten really good at pulling himself out and interrupting the loop and bringing himself back to the present, which is, again, a precept of emotional intelligence. Upon our conclusion here, he actually exclaimed, holy moly, we really covered a lot of ground. So I encourage you to listen to uh, the entirety of this episode. I think you'll find a lot there. Also check out the series that I did with Ian Morgan Cron and check out his latest book that was our muse there, The Story of You. Uh, he's also got a top ranked podcast as well, Typology. A note here, Ian recently uprooted and moved from his stylish home in Franklin, Tennessee to the middle of Mexico just to shake things up in his life. Uh, he spoke with me from his new home where you're going to hear cars driving by on the cobblestone streets outside. I hope you'll find intrigue in the background noise as I did. You can also watch this full episode on YouTube if you want. Just search for Self Helpful with Kevin Miller. Ian, as I was thinking about talking on emotional intelligence with you today, I think what hit me is the hope that I feel. Because as Scott Allender talked about, we so often think that we are emotional, emotionally intelligent because of how we relate to other people's emotions and may, you know, how we perceive that we uh that we can understand them somewhat without thinking about ourselves. And am I emotionally intelligent? So I love that because it means, oh, I've thought I was emotionally intelligent and yet I'm having these relational and personal problems that belie that. Now we've showcased to be, you know, not to rib on myself, but I've been a fool in that. I'm not emotionally intelligent, not as much as I thought. What great hope that now I can look in the mirror and start at the foundation and address what I've been missing thus far. And that feels hopeful. And I felt that same thing from you when we first talked about the Enneagram along these lines. Hmm. Well, w w one could argue that the recognition that we are struggling with self-awareness is itself a sign of increasing self-awareness. So it's, Fair. you know, uh, I think it, you, there, this is a moment for a little bit of Self-congratulation. Okay. Yeah. And grace, it's like, okay, well, now, now you've just proven that you are uh, on a journey of self-discovery leading to greater self-awareness. I'll accept that. I had a meditation expert on the show one time and I asked her, I said, you know, uh, she's the founder of Muse. And I, and I said, uh, you know, if I'm thinking about meditating, should I be aware of my mind, my state of mind right now? And if I'm pretty frantic, is that maybe, do I need to like calm down first and maybe not try to meditate then? Or is that right, the right time to meditate? And she said, whoa, whoa, stop. She said, just what you did. First off, you get kudos for even thinking about it, even being aware. So, okay. Step one uh, in that. I think the other thing, Ian, on this was, again, a hopeful feeling thought that we put so much cultural emphasis on IQ, right? Somebody has a high IQ. And I kind of think, 
I, I doesn't mean anything to me. It, it has that has no bearing on their ability. It shows me maybe they have some capacity, but it has no bearing on their ability, their wisdom, their relational skills. And I've seen, as a matter of fact, I feel like I've seen people with higher IQs have more problems with relationships and culture and society. I don't think they're any happier. But here on emotional intelligence, emotional quotient, I feel like if you're high in that, that's got to be a lot more hopeful. What do you think? Mm. No, I, I agree. I, I think uh, to your point, I, I, you know, in my work as a corporate consultant, I, I meet lots of people who have high IQs, and but they lack wisdom, right? And and part of wisdom uh, is, uh, you know, so so in other words, they, they they have a lot of information, but they yeah. they but but the application or the wise application of the information is lacking. Right. And they also usually lack experience. Right. So that's that's another piece of the equation. If they're younger, they, they just can't they can't put that into operation yet because they just don't they don't have enough mileage in the rearview mirror to make sense of it. Right. But, you know, I think that that EQ is this capacity for self-reflection, uh, emotional, intellectual self-reflection, creating the natural environment in which that kind of self-reflection can take place on a regular basis, on an ongoing basis. Um, and that the fact that it's possible gives me hope. Yes. I, again, in looking at, I would have said I was in the past before you and Scott said I was fairly emotionally intelligent in my ignorance because I'm aware of managing myself my own emotional expression, at least. Okay, so I manage my emotional expression. Um, doesn't mean I'm managing it well inside, but I didn't put those two together. And I'm really socially aware, even to an empathic aspect of feeling what other people feel and reading the room. But it doesn't mean I really related to their emotions. So I'm looking at that and going, "Am I? is that pretty common that Again, people key on certain, maybe some abilities they think that they have, and again, think that they're emotionally intelligent. And meanwhile, we're hurting ourselves even worse because we're so dramatically ignorant. Yes. In fact, there's, there's a research that's been done on this. Like, like The research reveals that the more self-aware people think they are, the less they are. Really? Like th that's just a fact in the research, right? And the more intensely they think or believe that they're self-aware, right? They're even less self-aware. Like, like, so the more, you know, sure they are, like, like there's an old, like I remember I worked with a guy once and he was a, I don't know, CFO of a pretty big company. And I asked him, you know, well, tell me how self-aware you are. And he told me, I think I'm pretty self-aware. And then I went out and I asked all the people around him. Uh-huh. Right. And that he worked with. And they're like, he has no self-awareness. So I went back and I told him that he got really, really mad. And he said, don't you think I'd know if I wasn't self-aware? And I was like, <laughs> bingo. <Yeah. laughs> no, the answer is no, dude. Of course you wouldn't know. Like, you know, it's like and, and of course, like I, I, there's a guy in the private equity world who said to me once in a moment of real transparency, he said, I'm really frightened about. The things I don't know that I don't know. Yes. You know, yes. And, and so this is how he and I got into a conversation about, about self-awareness. Let me ask you a question. Uh -huh. From a self-awareness perspective, now, what internal state, emotional state, do you think would be really important to cultivate so that it's your dominant internal emotional state all the time? You know what I'm saying? Like you could say, uh, you know, it's joy or it's this or that. But what, what I, I've been thinking about it for my own life. And this, this really does touch on the topic of self-awareness. Thanks for the question. The first thing that popped into mind, and it was on mine because you said the word a minute ago, was grace. Mm, okay. uh, I find that I don't give myself grace. I don't give others. And it just ramps up my anxiety about things that I shouldn't be anxious 
mm-hmm. about. And it could even be a positive thing, an exciting thing. But I, I look at it and realize I'm, I'm kind of anxious and I'm kind of, I'm kind of stressed. Like things are, I'm going to do something wrong and make the wrong, you know, decision. And if I step back and really look at it, nobody's going to die. I'm probably, I have a pretty good track record here. I don't really know why my panties are in a wad and I keep coming back. When you first said it, I thought peace, but then I thought Mm -hmm. grace. I don't know. What do you think? Well, I think for me, it's a term that most people don't throw around a lot, but uh, it's one that I've really tried to focus on trying to cultivate in my inner life as a dominant overarching emotion or reality. And it's equanimity and Mm -hmm. equanimity. What that means is the uh, the ability to maintain emotional and spiritual balance in the face of whatever life throws at you. Huh. So emotional it's spiritual. Interesting. Keep going. So in other words, not to be flat, but in other words, let's say I, I you know, we hang up the phone and I get a, call, a phone call that someone I really, really love uh, has been hurt, or. You know, then I get another phone call and somebody I get some news that, you know, uh, some wonder I've won the lottery. Now, most people are flying around in their emotional states, you know, up and down, up and down. They're just being thrown around by ideas and thoughts and experiences. And I think one sort of internal state, and this is back again to emotional, Mm -hmm. you know, EQ. This is all about EQ I'm talking about here. How can I move through the world with more emotional balance or equanimity so that I I can respond, not react, but respond to everything that's coming in at me at any given moment with calm, with with groundedness, centeredness, uh, not being thrown off my game, thrown off my my heels. You know, someone said to me, uh, I have a small group of very uh, high achieving guys that are part of a program that I run. And uh, we meet three weekends a year in cool places, and it's awesome. It's a wonderful, wonderful group. And uh, one of the guys said, well, tell me how you, Ian, measure you – know, how do you know if you're spiritually fit? And I said, by how easy it is to offend me. Wow. Like, like for me, if, if it's – you know, if, if I'm walking around and everybody's offending me <laughs> – the woman behind the cashier at CVS or, you know, my publisher or this, uh, you know, don't you know who I think I am is going through my head. Then I know I'm off my game. And that's a lack of equanimity. Just, mm-hmm. you know, just being too thin skinned. And I want to be that. And you said peace. I want to have that kind of kind of calm mm-hmm. that walks through the world with wisdom. I, you said it. I, I wrote it down and then about 15 seconds later, you said it as you were talking, I thought grounded groundedness. That is a word that I use and literally do uh, daily is I've got my feet off in the dirt and, and try to do that. And I want to be that way emotionally again, though, Ian, I thought I was just because I stoically, which I like the, the concept of stoicism. I, I know there's different sides of that, but the healthy side of that, I like that being able to control yourself, but I was really focused on an outward expression concept. And inside I was just, I think people would say, well, you, I don't know. What do you think? I, on one hand, kind of stuffing it sort of, or just really ignoring it, running away from it. Literally. I might just, I'm just going to go for a run and we go for a ride, put music on, have a glass of wine, whatever it is. I eat, Uh, I'm going to do that and just get happy, just get inspired. And I never dealt with it, but I thought because it's not controlling me outwardly and because I can, I'm going to use the word Medicaid. I don't know if there's a word you like better, but because I can do something there, I thought I was, and yet I wasn't able to sit with it. And like you said, be, well, it's use that word that I like grounded Mm -hmm. and be able to feel it as well. Does that make sense? Sure. And you can do both. I mean, okay. you can be grounded and feel things very, very uh, powerfully. And and sometimes we, we feel things very powerfully and it does feel like it's, you know, throwing us off center, but we can be present for it. So let me give you an example of emo- an emotionally intelligent move, right? Mm-hmm. I have clients who say to me all the time, I'm anxious, I'm angry, I'm this, I'm that. And I go, stop, 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 stop. What you should say is uh, – Anxiety is here right now. Yeah. 
Anger is here right now. Uh, frustration is here right now. Because every time you say I am, you are now over identifying who you are as a human being with a negative emotion. Mm -hmm. You're Kevin Miller. You're not angry. <laughs> Anger is present right now. And, and see, when you do that, you, you can begin to kind of declaw some of that, those emotions, right? And, and so rather than getting yourself uh, sort of mixed up in the, these negative emotions and to kind of regain equanimity, I just say, ah, look, you know, look, let me give you an example, mm -hmm. personal example of this. So five days ago, my mom died. Mm. And she she was 95 years old and, uh, you know, she, you know, she wasn't a huge surprise. Right. And uh, but still. Right. Mm. Sad. And uh, in the moment, I remember thinking, oh, sadness is here. Mm. Grief is here. And then I can look at it and I, I know this sounds this is Ian being creepy, weird, emotional, spiritual dude. Right. Like, but whatever. And I go. Crazy as this sounds, I go, welcome sadness. Welcome grief. Of course you're here. Of course you're here. And you will come and you will have your way with me and you will go and then life will continue. Uh, that's the kind of stuff I, I, I try to practice in my own uh, emotional, in, 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 in a bid to increase my emotional wisdom and intelligence. On what you just said there, I'm thinking about self-awareness. Mm -hmm. What a great perspective to at any time set my watch would be great. You know, literally every hour or so. And that would be the chime is what is here? Yes. What is your sadness here? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is a great that you're actually coming up with a great practice, right? And it's a spiritual and emotional psychological practice. Right? So literally when I sit down with my, my, my men's, uh, cohort. Uh, one of the first things we do every time we sit in the course of a day, I start by saying, what's here right now? And everybody has to go around and give me one word as to describe what's here right now. And that hmm. could be anticipation, uh, you know, fatigue, uh, worry, uh, whatever, you know, joy. And guys just go around and they just name what's here for them. Right. And uh, I think that's, that is emotional intelligence is the capacity to have the vocabulary even to talk about what's here right now. I, I love the concept, Ian. So I have a guys, I call them a you know, guys group. We meet every week, literally in my town. We've done it for decades and we are doing life together, you know, talking about marriage and, and uh, parenting and fan and, and work and whatever. And, and we'll get together and just shoot the bull a little bit to begin with, you know, just talk about whatever. And somebody will have something on their mind and we'll talk about that and whatever that then at some point to say, okay, uh, before we leave here today, what what is, I'm going to reframe it like you just talked about because my intent is to say what's what's the predominant thing. That's kind of what I'll say. What's the predominant thing that I don't want to be surprised if two days from now I hear oh you you know something's up in the marriage or you're just you know there's a financial issue. I don't want you to be surprised. So what's that primary thing on your mind? And some you know some guy last week it was he's dealing with something with a with a kid. Uh, another one did have something that this brewing at work, and I want to hear that thing. Coming, but I like how you're stating it there of what is, what is here right now? What's that predominant, what is here? But yeah, I love it from a moment to moment. What is here right now for me to, that's what I need to do because that's where I don't pay attention to it. And I find out, man, I've let anxiety on something chew on me all day long in my lack of self-awareness. And maybe that's the point. If we're not, or would you say, if we're not being self-aware, if we're not doing that, if we're not checking in, Termites are gnawing away at us. I mean, it, it just by proxy has to be true. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me this. Uh, when you're anxious, uh, well, mm -hmm. tell me right now, what are you feeling right now? What's the predominant mood, your emotion you're feeling right now? I um, mean, this the, the conversations like this talk about something. And we're here talking about it because I care about it for me, literally. Mm -hmm. It wasn't because I thought it was a cool topic that everybody would be interested. It's for me. So I'm really, my first thought when you asked what was inspired. Um, kind of uplifted. I'm I'm kind of jazzed uh, mm -hmm. for sure. And and because you know, like you, we've been doing this long enough. Even though this is a podcast and our work and whatever, I would. This is no different than if we were sitting at your house in Mexico having a tequila together and talking about the. Uh, I love this. This is absolutely yeah. cool. 
Okay. Where does that live in your body? Tell me where that, where does inspiration live? Like when you feel it, where do you feel it in your body? Gosh, it's, it's all up. It's kind of up here. I kind of feel it chest and head a little bit. Is that possible? Sure. Okay. Yeah. And it's not right, down in the gut. Okay. What oh. color is it? Well, this is, this is unfair because right behind your screen, I have my Spotify. I think I have, I, you've got you on a huge screen and there's a big red square. So I, I got red on the mind. It may not be a fair question. Okay, whatever. Or a fair matter. answer, a fair answer, just because I'm looking at a red box. Sure. That may be relevant though. I mean, that's kind of excited. That's kind of a celebratory thing. I'm also mm -hmm. thinking about Mexico since you're sitting there and you got a picture of the sun behind you and maybe it is red. So I could go through it sort of a step-by-step um, -step thing that I do with people and sometimes in groups, like with guys, uh, a guy will say, I'm feeling anxious. And I go, okay, let's just stop as a group. Let me ask you some questions. Where, where is it right now? We, we can, if you want to, we, we can do it. I mean, if this, especially if this is a takeaway that somebody can do, if you want to do yeah, it. Well, so yeah, I would ask, for example, yeah, just tell me what color is it, right? And you said red. Well, what, tell me the temperature. What, what, what's the temperature of that feeling of inspiration? Mm, it's a good warm. It's not overly hot. It's a. Uh, it's mm. like the, the best time to go out for a run, man. I'm not going to sweat right. to death, but it's not cool. It's perfect. Mm, is it? Is it? What's the texture like? Mm, the texture, like literally tactile. Yeah. Like if um, I picked it up, would it be? Uh, would it be like sandpaper? Would it be kind of slimy and wet? The word that came to mind was supple. Okay, great. So now we could continue on with this, right? And all I'm trying to do is have you become what, what I would call somatically aware. Mm -hmm. So somatic in the body, mean, mm -hmm. right? When you do somatic work, it's in the body. Uh, because, you know, like we know this now from the, the, the current research, especially in the last 10 years, that, you know, your body doesn't lie to you. Mm -hmm. Like we are so divorced. We have been so divorced from our bodies. And we've been taught in school and everywhere. It's like, who cares about your body? Talk about your mind. Everything is like, you know, it's like, it's like you're a brain on a stick, but your body has a brain of its own. It has an intelligence of its own. We know that it's a fact. So all I'm trying to do when I'm working with people is say to them, uh, listen, could your body not uh, throw a flag up the pole for you to tell you what's happening inside at any given moment? So, you know, there are times when, um, uh, you know, let's say when, when, I, when anger comes up for me, I know exactly where it lives. And when it starts to trigger in me, like I know what, like it is at the, it is at the base of my neck. It's like someone has got their hands around my neck and they're starting to choke me, right? Cut off my wind. Mm -hmm. And, and because of that, when it starts, rather than being asleep and reactive, I go, oh. Anger is here. And then I can start to make choices. Do I want to continue down this path of anger? Do I want to transform this anger into uh, an intelligent conversation with somebody who I feel has hurt me or, you know, in some way, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. That's, again, kind of a picture of or dimension of, of self-awareness. Now, it's a little bit of a graduate school degree in self-awareness, granted, but anybody can, can begin to do that work. Okay. I want to dig in on that one, Ian, because so for everybody listening, we just recently did a series with Britt Frank. Uh, she's a therapist. Her new book is called The Science of Stuck. We talk specifically about anxiety because her shtick is anxiety is not a bad thing. Anxiety is not something that you catch or that's bad in and of itself. Your anxiety is your body doing what it's supposed to do, telling you, hey, something's going on. Now pay attention to it. And she talks about being about body. So body awareness and body reactions or whatever are real important to her. So I heard that. We, you know, we talked about it. I get it intellectually. I'm still struggling with embracing it because it feels like a chicken and egg issue. So help me help us understand it more. Because if I say, oh, anger, you know, here my body reacts and anger's here. Well, mm -hmm. I, I'm thinking it's because my brain is, it's because I'm not grounded. If I was at peace, if I was, if I was where I should be, it shouldn't happen. So I'm still thinking about it as a mind issue and it's hard for me to validate the body response. Does that make sense? I mean, I'm just admitting that I'm struggling with it. Yeah. I mean, um, there is, you know, we are, 
we're not bento boxes, right? We we're um, we are um, we're soups. Okay, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. So it's it's hard. We like to think we can break ourselves down and analyze individual parts, but they're all living in relationship. Uh, but listen, the. the I think what she's trying to grab at or not, she, let me just give you this as a way to think about, it. you know, in cognitive behavioral therapy, mm -hmm. right? The way that we think and the, the way that we act affects the way that we feel. Mm -hmm. And then the way that we feel uh, affects the way that we think <laughs> that affects the, do you see where I'm going? Yeah. That yeah. affects the way that we act. That, so these are loops, Right. These are loops. One thing lands on another, lands on another. Now, arguably, CBT therapy is the most effective, at least the research shows, of all therapeutic interventions with with therapists. OK, so in other words, you know, you get anxious, you're on an airplane. Right. And you start to think about it falling out of the sky. And uh, then uh, you, you know, uh, tense up and you, uh, you know, grab the seats, you know, the arms of the seats. So, so you act and then you start to feel anxious. And then the anxiety only intensifies the thoughts that intensify the, the act. Right? Sure. So now you're now you're ordering drinks. Right. Sure. Right. <laughs> now right. we're ordering drinks. Right. right. And then and that. So and now we're creating a loop that requires interruption. Right. Right. And so, again, uh, this is what I just described there is self-awareness, right? It's like I know in my own life that uh, the way I think affects the way I act, which affects the way I feel, which affects the way I think, which affects the way I act. You know what I mean? And so I can observe, Kevin, in real time in my own life, I'd like to think a lot. A lot but I still have a long way to go, okay? But I can spot the loops, yeah. And I can see how my, you know, my thoughts are triggering certain feelings that are, you know, or triggering certain actions that are triggering other feelings and, and, and be able to step back from myself, observe it and make choices. That, that's a lot of what self-awareness and emotional intelligence is all about. Can I, for example, monitor and regulate the way that I predictably act, think and feel from moment to moment on a daily basis, hmm. whether I'm talking with my kids or my spouse or with myself, uh, doesn't matter. Uh, can I? And I think, by the way, that requires equanimity, which we talked about earlier. Uh, are there things that prevent me from doing it? Right. Like I'll give you an example. Kooky, bad diet. <laughs> OK, Everything's related, man. So if I drink five cups of coffee a day, let me tell you, I have no equanimity and I will get a little bat crap crazy and, and start to live in a more reactive, less, you know, a way that's just not intelligent. So I've, I've just learned certain patterns and behaviors and practices that keep me in a good space so I can live that way in the world. Well, I, so I'll ask, and, and it may be, the answer may be yes to both, but do you find yourself less in a loop, meaning you're able to avoid being in the loop, or do you just find yourself more aware to, as you said, and I love the term, to uh, more aware so that you interrupt the loop? Yeah, I can interrupt the circuit. Okay. So, so or happens. oh yeah, it's, it's going to happen. But you okay? Keep going. Yeah, but you interrupt the loop. I love that term. Yeah, and so you know, if you so that it doesn't get me into a cycle of what might be called an unvirtuous cycle. Right. Okay. And what I want to do is be able to spot it. And with and now to your point about grace, this is so important. And I bet your friend or you mentioned earlier who'd been on the show. Um, I have you have to address this stuff going on inside with a tremendous amount of self-compassion and curiosity. No judgment, no self-condemnation. No. You know what I mean? It's almost like just to look at it and go, huh. Now, that's an interesting thought creating that action, creating this feeling. And of course I'm doing it because I'm a human being and human beings do these sorts of things. And so it's understandable. What new choices can I make right now in light of what I'm experiencing? 
so that I'm responding, I'm not reacting, uh, I'm coming from a place of wisdom, uh, not shooting from the lip uh, yeah. with somebody or from the hip in my life. Yeah. So I, I hope I'm describing what my experience of my personal experience and understanding of emotional intelligence or EQ is, you know. Again, I like that idea of interrupting the loop. When you asked me earlier about just anxiety, you know, what's going on during the day, and I talked about setting my watch, that would, I like that perspective of I'm doing that to be, to, to be, because I am going to be in a loop. I'm human. And like you said, this happens, cause and effect is going on, body, mind, body, mind, and be aware of what the loop is. And you may realize, man, I'm, I'm in a good spot at the moment. I'm, I am, sure. at, I am grounded or whatnot. But often I'm going to find myself in somewhat of a loop. I, I I keep coming back as you're talking of thinking, because it relates to me, that those who think they're the most self-aware are often the least. Because that would, in grace, in in grace, that, that would be me. And I just, I don't even know if I prided myself. I just thought I am an aware person. And then as time has gone on and as I became not, um, or, or became uh, less at peace, more anxiety, whatnot, realized, yeah, I, I am not. And when you said, you said something to the effect of me, you know, you mentioned the, the, the concept of spirituality. And I thought, that's how I see spirituality right now. When I see someone who is rock solid, black and white, absolutely certain about their spirituality, I, my red flags go up. Because uh, I was also very certain there in the past as well. I am less certain about spirituality uh, than I ever have. I think in a good way now. Um, I, I'm starting to make peace with that mystery. But it's a great call out to everybody listening to if you feel I'm self-aware, rate yourself, the higher the rating, you might be the most at risk. How can we say that in grace, though? That should be hopeful, right? Yeah, listen, uh, I think everything should be said with grace. I mean, listen, it's uh, being a human being is hard, <laughs> mm -hmm. Fair. you know, and I, y you know, this because we, we've talked about it. I'm in a 12 step group for, for people in recovery from, uh, you know, alcohol and chemical addictions. And, and you know, I uh, been thinking lately because inventorying ourselves is a big piece of that program. In other words, taking a look at our liabilities and our assets, our care, what we call defects of character. And one of the things that has struck me, and I'm 62 years old, so it's not like I, you know, I showed up here 20 minutes ago. I, I mean, I realized just in the last few months just how many blind spots I have. Like, like, like there are things I dislike about other people, and if I really sit down and think about it, it's because they are so glaring in my own life that I just don't want to see them played out in front of me by somebody else. Fair. You know, and I can do that work, by the way, without prosecuting myself and, you know, beating myself up and, you know, relegating myself to some inner gulag. You know, that's that's not what the journey of self-awareness and, and spirituality is. It's to go, oh, OK, so there's a there's a new frontier. There's a, a new place for me to go to work. Well, uh, so on that note, and you've mentioned a couple of times, and we talked about it in the first series that we did together, your work with a lot of a lot of high profile uh, people, men especially. So a lot of people out there in the corporate world, you're working with you're working with heavy hitters. With them, how much do you? press in on emotional intelligence. I, you know, in Scott's book, and it may be in yours well, but he talks about emotional intelligence. He cites it as the single biggest predictor of our personal and professional mm -hmm. success, which again, elevates it to me to look at that. He didn't say IQ, but he said, you know, EQ in essence, emotional quotient, emotional intelligence. So when you start working, when you have the next person, the next executive, you know, CEO of Fortune, whatever company come to work with you, is that a forerunner, front runner for you? Say, okay, if we're going to work together. Uh, we're going to dig into the, yes. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Um, now that said, sometimes it, you know, the instruction isn't direct. It, it's something that's uh, leaking into every single thing we're talking okay. about, you know? 
Um, so, but we just kind of, you know, if, let's say I'm on a zoom call. I did, I just did with you what I do with a guy, you know, I might, I might say, uh, well, tell me where that lives in your body. <laughs> and mm-hmm. I want them to get in touch right in that moment with where it is. I want them to become aware of it, not to be intimidated by it, not to push it away, not to hold on to it, just to be able to be present with it and see it and to see how it's, a how it's affecting them in a particular situation. It's interesting. You know, most of the guys I work with, they're, they're pretty well educated and thoughtful uh, guys. And they they're OK going to woo woo places with me, actually. It's Wait, amazing. Well, I, I was going to ask that, Ian. I was going to ask about their propensities along this line. But it's also not a fair survey in essence, because we're not going out and just cherry picking this CEO, this CEO, this CEO. We're talking about the ones that found their way to you, which by proxy is going to make them a little more open to this. Is that fair? Yeah, I think, uh, well, first of all, I would delineate, I'm a, I coach them. I don't, I'm not a consultant. Right? Okay. So I'm not consulting their businesses and trying right. to, you know, let's fire this person and let's, you know, rearrange this, to, to blah, blah, blah. I'm talking to them about their inner lives, their work, what they want to accomplish, how to get there. And a lot of it does have to do with, you know, uh, with self-discovery and self-mastery. Yeah. And that's what I'm, t- I'm trying to teach them how to do. Uh, and, and, and sharing my own, well, I don't share it with them necessarily, but just born of my own failures and some successes with it. Where do you find them though? The average, if we're just going to say the average, you know, however we want to typify them type a high performance CEO type person, where do you find, find them on the scale of cultural emotional intelligence do you find that they're often they are more emotionally intelligent or are they less or how does it ebb and flow and this may my question would really i'm going to put it beyond just your personal coaching clients just as you look at the high performers out there where would you say they fall more or less you know uh, that's a hard one and some of it's a little bit industry dependent in a way Tell Sometimes. me more. Okay. Well, like I meet a lot of guys in uh, like in Silicon Valley and people in tech startups in the tech world. You know, a lot of them are so they are very open to spiritual conversations. Yeah. Now, I don't know if it's the San Francisco thing or whatever. You know, it's just they just tend to be open to ideas like mindfulness meditation and uh, talking about uh compassion and talking about those certain now if i go to work in oftentimes if i'm working with an investment banker from goldman sachs that may not be their their jam there's a whole different cultural dynamic going on one thing i do notice is that people get very interested in emotional intelligence uh typically when they have a crash of some kind sure right because all of a sudden now they're in crisis somebody's identified it the fact that it has to do with their own internal issues that are unprocessed unmanaged un- unacknowledged whatever uh, and that may be they're getting fired, they're about to get fired, or they've reached a, a point where their effectiveness is no longer in play. Sorry, by the way, I live I live here in a, on a street in in yeah. my little town in Mexico, and it's it it, it it it's cobblestones, and so when people go by, it can be a lot more noisy than than if it were if, if I was living in Manhattan. Good cultural ambiance. That's it. Anyway, so my point is is that. You know, one of the maybe the, the factors that often brings people into a coaching relationship with me is is they've sort of hit a moment of of uh, needing help being being effective because or because they've crashed in a relationship or in their job or with kids or whatever. You know, they, they come my way searching for some answers in that regard. Well- in candor, that's why we're sitting here talking about it, Ian. It's not because I just thought it was an interesting topic. This is one mm-hmm. I've been I got hit with probably, I wish it was longer, um, but I'm going to say five ish years ago, really. And came to i I'll call it, I'll call it a slash a burnout slash bitterness, both in Mm -hmm. fact, and realize I'm here. So here I am thinking I, not that I had it really conceptualized what emotional intelligence is, but somebody would have said, asked me, I would have said, Oh no, I, I I am because of, you know, I thought my, I thought I was self-aware. I thought I was a lot of things until apparently I wasn't and I was burnt yeah. out and I was bitter and I had consequences all around me from work to relationships. And I'm just looking at the collateral damage, which again is the hope of some of everybody listening to this show and listen to this topic that 
Well, back to what you said, you are in a loop. We're all in a loop because we're human. You are, and either you're aware or you're not. It made it interesting to me the next, when you talked about somebody, you, know, you, you had a, uh, an anonymous example of somebody and you asked him how emotionally aware or emotionally intelligent he was, how self-aware he says, oh, very self-aware. That'd be a great question. How many times today have you caught yourself in a bad loop that you had to step out of? And of course, if you'd asked me that, you know, even in recent times, I would have said, well, I haven't. And you would have said, bingo, I guess. You're not self-aware, true? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I can even, I could probably name two or three loops I found myself in today, you know. Uh, but listen, uh, one of the things that I think helps us live in a perpetual state of sort of can I maybe another way can I maybe throw, let's throw another word let's throw two other words out here okay to add them to the lexicon one would be uh, mindfulness and the other one would be consciousness now I know that people of faith for example right. they all get freaky out about this stuff and I'm always like oh please get a critical mind it just drives me crazy when people get anxious about new ideas anyway I say look to live mindfully rather than mindlessly, right? Yeah. So how do we cultivate a mind that is awake, that is conscious, moving consciously through the world, not on autopilot, have asleep most of the time, right? Yeah. And I think, by the way, most people go through life like, like zombies, <laughs> just wandering around and like, you know, banging guardrail to guardrail into other people's lives and making dumbass mistakes over and over again, the same ones over and over again, mm -hmm. and then scratching their head and not knowing why. That's how you can know when you're around somebody. It doesn't have a lot of emotional intelligence, a lot of EQ. You know, it's like, uh-oh, this person's like on autopilot. They're, they just are completely unfamiliar with their own inner architecture. So one of the practices that I have every single guy do, right, is uh, one of – you can do one of two. One is calling it mindfulness practice, which is a meditation practice daily, a daily meditation practice. Yeah. Why? Because the research, the scientific research, not like, you know, the opinion of a guru somewhere, it's science, whether it's from Stanford, from Harvard, from John Hopkins, from University of Massachusetts Amherst, from really great researchers, that people who have a regular daily mindfulness meditation practice move through the world with an infinitely greater amount of, of emotional intelligence. It's a fact because you have the capacity then to uh, you're cultivating an inner observer who can watch what's happening. It's like you, you're, you, we know for, from the research that in schools where it's required of little kids to do it at the beginning of every class, little kids, that the incidence of bullying goes down double digit percent in the school culture. Well, what is that? It's kids developing emotional intelligence. Oh, when I call that kid X, I can see on their face that it hurts them. When you're on autopilot, you miss all of that. Do, do you under, you, do, I, I do. I, sense. You totally are. So here's my question on that, Ian, is – I, cause I, I have a heart for when we miss things. We, kind of back to the we, what your friend said, the most dangerous things, we don't know what we don't know. It's even worse when we think that we do like that. You know, the, mm -hmm. Thinking that you're self-aware, it's even worse when you're not and you think you are. And so when you talk about being an autopilot and just going around like, you know, zombies or whatever, that we tend to associate, how can I say this? Um, we expect or, or give credit to high performing people, which I'm not trying to pick on high performing people because I am a high performing people. I've proven that. Uh, so, you know, at least out there in the culture and achieving things and, and whatnot. And so I am, but that we think that since they're high performing, they're not on autopilot, that they're aware that they got it. And I think, no, we don't. Uh, I'm, I, I can go out there and I can perform and emotionally be on autopilot. It may even serve me well if I'm in a high anxiety, you know, type thing, or if I'm on the battlefield or on the playing field or whatever, that may be great, but I'm going along and I'm achieving this stuff. It looks really good on paper. And then something 
happens or it doesn't happen, but you, you know, something happens like burnout, bitterness, that, like you said, and that's when people crash and then they finally come to you for help. They didn't think that they were on autopilot. They thought they were killing it, man. They were kicking butt and taking names. And you can do that and be emotionally on autopilot. Yes. Oh yeah. But that's what I think that's what we miss because we think that if you're achieving stuff out there, the stuff that we applaud, that you got it going on, and we just see that that is not the case, and we're we're blind. That feels like the big myth, doesn't it? Does it? Listen, listen. You can be very successful and not self aware. People prove it all the time. It just depends on how you define it, success. And oftentimes, a lot of times, those people are also successful in one particular arena and disasters in all the others. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. You know? So it's a very complicated, uh, you know, self-awareness has to be cultivated across m- many, many different facets of one's life. Uh, and, you know, um, I guess I, I'm always trying to encourage men to um, pursue practices that will help them live in a greater state of conscious awareness throughout their, their data. You know, do you know what I'm saying? Like I'm always and and like, for example, I'm always asking like guys will call me, I'm in a really bad place. I go, when was the last time you drank water? Hmm. <laughs> Did you eat breakfast? You, they'll say no. I'll go, okay, well call me back and go eat something. Call me back in three hours. Tell me how you're doing. Hmm. And you'd be surprised how many times people text me back saying, you know, I feel better now. It's like, yeah, okay, but it's blood sugar. Uh, so when was the last time you exercised? Mm-hmm. How much did you sleep last night? Uh, or have you been sleeping every night? Uh, are you lonely or, or, or feeling detached from too many people? Right. Those are five things I can ask people. Those are questions around emotional intelligence. I can stop and say to myself, oh, water, oh. I'm lonely. I need to call somebody. It's just knowing these are even like the basics of life need to be addressed uh, with awareness. I mean, how many people, you know, that run through the day on a cup of coffee, they don't even know what they're, you know, what they're eating or, you know, how it's affecting their moods and the way they relate to people. That's part of self-awareness too. Okay. Let me ask you about in that vein, Scott in his book has the four domains of emotional intelligence. Number one, self-awareness. Number two, Mm self-management. Number three, social awareness. And four, relationship management. I want to stay on the topic here of just high performers. That's who you work with. And I think that's who we tend to applaud and want to be. I mean, my book's called What Drives You? Everybody wants to be driven, you know, which is, is great. I love that as well. My curiosity is the loops we get stuck in and how we damage ourselves and our unawareness. So when you look at those four domains, self, again, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, and relationship management, my curiosity is where in your experience are we most likely blind to it? Ooh. Hmm. Give them to me again. I uh, yeah. I, one I know. Okay, because I was thinking about it for myself. I was trying to rate myself. So, so one, self-awareness. Two, two self-management. Three, social awareness. And four, relationship management. Yeah, it's, I, I think it's relationship management. Tell me more. Well, I mean, relationships are, are the most important thing in our lives. And also the most complicated thing in our lives, right? Uh, And, you know, the greatest mystery we have to face every day is uh, ourselves and and the people we interact with. Mm -hmm. I mean, listen, I've been married for 33 years. I get up every day and think there are, I seem to be meeting my wife all the time for the first time. You know what I mean? It's like we are multi-layered. We contain universes of inside of us that, we, we, we won't get to the end of our lives having explored all of them. And, and then sort of relate to another human being is intensely difficult and requires some real effort. And I think awareness um, and also it requires so much physical and emotional and mental 
I mean, just so many calories to burn, <laughs> maintain, you know, maintaining in, uh, relationships. It's, it's, uh, and yet it's the most valuable thing that we do for sure. When I looked at it, if I was going to rate the top two most important, I would put self, number one, self-awareness and number four, relationship management. And when I rated myself, Ian, I was thinking about it earlier today, I thought I'm, I think of myself as best amongst those in number two and three, self-management and social awareness. And, and then self, but, but number one, self-awareness and what you said, relationship management. Yeah, I did. I did. I, I did not realize until latter years and lots of counseling how weak I was in those. I would say negligent, actually negligent mm -hmm. yeah. in that, which yeah. is. What's your, are you a three on the Enneagram? I can't remember. Are you a three or an eight? I'm a seven. A seven. I'm seven. a seven with a, a three close. I mean, yeah, three is. Yeah. 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 Okay. So you're in an aggressive stance. You're a, you're a seven. So one of the things I love about the Enneagram, and I'm not pitching a pitching myself or my books on it right now. That's okay. I am. That's why it's behind me right there over my shoulder. There's one your, of them. Yeah. I mean, look, your other I, one, I, the other one's above. Yeah. Oh, nice. Well, yeah. here's the thing. The, the Enneagram does give us this amazing tool for cultivating self-awareness just simply by understanding, well, what, what, what has been my unconscious driver? What motivates me? What, uh, what, what are the kinds of things that uh, fuel unhealthy behaviors in my life? And where, where do I need to shine the light uh, uh, on so I can pick up where my blind spots are, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not a perfect tool, but it's, it's damn good. I mean, let's, it, it's, it's really good. And I use it with my clients almost from day one. And when I go on these weekends with guys, one of the first ones we do is a weekend or at least a, a good solid half day of that first weekend on the Enneagram and on their types. Um, because of its, you know, it's just, you know what it does, Kevin? It just saves you time, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's what a good instrument does. And that's what a good teacher does is just save you time. And, uh, so I, um, I feel like with a, with a seven, you know, one of the difficulties can be distraction, right? And in, in self-awareness, a seven can be moving so fast and so far in front of themselves out over their skis, you mm -hmm. know, always, always skating one foot ahead of the crack coming up behind them. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so it's very hard to be self-aware if you, if you're, if it's, an, if you're not staying in the present, right. If you're always in the future, you know, you're not here for what needs to be paid attention to. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. So that's a, I'm just saying, we're, we're making a, uh, a case for a tool like the Enneagram. And there are others that will help you develop some of the insights that we're, we're talking about today. It, it is. I mean, I'm a product of it. That's why you're sitting here. That's why you turned me on to Scott is because the understanding, just what you talked about there, you know, I'm so much more aware mm -hmm. of that as a seven with these propensities that I tend to, I kind of, the ter term that resonates with me, I kind of get off on the last minute on the staying ahead of the crack. I kind of dig that, which is fun. If I'm on one of my big mountain bike trips, that's what I'm there right. for, man. Let's go wild. Right. But in life, I've been doing that. And now as I have become more self-aware and, and realizing what I really want, which is to go back to peace and groundedness and those things that I was missing, I am now more frustrated. Uh, let's say that's not use frustrated. I'm more. I'm, I'm starting to be more intolerant of myself, and realizing, oh man, I'm just running and gunning again, and I don't have time. I've, I've taken myself. I've hijacked myself to where I can't. I don't have time, or I'm not taking the time to be grounded and to be mm -hmm. self aware. So I'm finding less taste for that aspect of myself, but I, but I would, you know, I want to ask you that though, but to come back, I mean, parts of it, I still love, I mean, I love being on the edge. I love going for stuff. I lie. I love biting off more than I can chew, but now I'm learning to, what would you say to budget it or to, or to designate it appropriately? Where, where would you go? Okay. Yes. Yeah, I think budget's actually a beautiful word because the question is, does your wife like it? <laughs> Not often. Okay. So uh -huh. there's relationship management, one thing, right? Uh -huh. uh, Self-awareness is saying, oh, just because I like to be that way in the world, what, what, why should I presume everybody else likes me to be that way? Oh, do my team. Do, we had that discussion this morning, Ian, with my, with my business manager of, 
of because it doesn't work with the team. I'll, I'll be last minute and it's wrecking things. We have so they're learning to make my deadlines two weeks before the real deadline. And you think because I know that it would no, it's perfect. Just tell me this is a drop dead date. We all know it's two weeks out here, but just I don't even I'm not even cognizant. I'm still gonna be me, but let's figure out how to manage me. Is that oh dude, I, I've worked with sevens before in corporate settings and and they will come into a meeting and just start riffing. They'll just start talking about dreams and they're huge. And like, ah, I think we could do this and we could do that. We could do this. And all then everyone, yeah. Oh yeah. And everybody's writing it down as though it's the plan. Yeah. And there's no plan. Like, it's, there is no plan. And in fact, all I was doing was throwing out ideas because it just seemed like a fun thing to do in the moment. And because, <laughs> yeah. And also because, right. you know, this stuff goes off in my head as a seven, like popcorn. Right. So it's like being cooked. Now, a person who's self-aware has done some work like you are, is realizing I can't do that. I just, I can't do that because what it's doing is it's landing on other people who aren't sevens in a way that they don't understand. And for me to presume that they are the same as I am is a kind of act of, you know, it's a little arrogant, right? It's, 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 no, it's not arrogant. It's just, it's just ignorance is that is what it is. So, you know, uh, can I, that that's well, can, you know. can I go right there though, Ian? Because because yeah. with that, so to, so for everybody listening, we're, so you're 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 aware of yourself. So that's the thing. To, okay, I'm a seven. I'm going to come in and be last minute. I'm going to talk concepts, whatnot. Now I still want to do that. What I have found myself doing now is I do want to do that, and so I have partnered, and now there's a business manager, and he can take that and then drill it down to, okay, here are the steps. And he manages the team for me and man, and they manage me and come back and go, okay, it's great, Kevin. Today, here's your drop dead stuff. You got to be, it's, this has to happen today. This has to happen. My point being, because it feels, I start to get uncomfortable when you're saying, okay, Kevin, that's what you do and you got to do something different. Well, I still want to be me. Is there yeah. a balance there though of saying, you know, yeah. okay, go. I don't want you to self-negate. What, okay. what I would say to you is go into those meetings and explain to them. Hey guys, for the first 10 minutes today, all we're going to do is have fun mm. whiteboarding and throwing the craziest ideas against the wall before we get down. You know what I'm saying? Or mm -hmm. like designate a once a month time to do that. Or, you know, but, but to kind of blow in and blow out and people are trying to keep up and they can't right. keep up. And, you know, you've got a high level of openness to experience, but you've got people around you, God willing, who have high levels of conscientiousness. Right. You, you got to have people working with a guy like you who are very what we call scoring high on the conscientiousness scale. There are people who put wheels on the things that crazy people like you think about. Right. And you just have to honor the fact that, oh, you know, if I come in here and just start coming up with 20 kooky ideas, it's actually going to scare some of the people on my team. They're going to be like, how do we do all that? Like how right. in what order should we do all those things he just talked about? Uh, and it's like. And then you run out of the room. You just kind of moved on uh, and not realizing that there's you may have left a little wreckage behind you. And self-awareness would, 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 would dictate to you, oh, I know I can do that. Here's my solution so that I can do it still in certain settings and enjoy it, but not in every setting where it can cause chaos. Th that's right where I was going to go. I wrote down as you're talking to, to again, first, it starts with me. If I'm not aware of myself, we're pissing in the wind to begin with. So um, I've got to be aware and then know where it's appropriate, where and when it's appropriate. Back to that word of budget, maybe, and kind of budget that. And, you know, and then it's a question or is it the question? It feels like the question then of, OK, now where do I modify myself according to this person or this group? Where do I modify? But that modification could also be a delegating, a partnering, an inclusion of somebody else with those other abilities that are needed because I'm probably never going to be that in a great way. I, that self-negating is important. Is I'm interested in that because I feel like people get caught in that and thinking, okay, here's the downsides of my style and I have to fix all those and not be who I am. What's the balance of that? Because we don't want to go over here because I'm going to have a propensity going, I just want to be a hundred percent me. I am what I am kind of thing. Where's the, that feels like a tension. You know, I have a friend of mine, he used to say to me, he goes, Ian, I want you to be your, just to be fully yourself. Unless of course you're a jerk. Yeah. Unless it pisses me off. <laughs> totally. There you go. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, I, I, you know, I just think it's uh, for me, it's like, uh, 
Yeah, there are parts of me that have to be disciplined. That's all. I just... I just have to regulate. Self-regulation is part of what we have to teach our children, right? No, you, yeah. you, you don't fart at the funeral. <laughs> That's lacking intelligence and self-regulation, right? We just, we're not going to do that, Billy, uh, especially when you're 26. We're just not going to do it, Billy. And, and so you, for me, there are things that I as an Enneagram 4 could do, you know, without really thinking about it, leave a lot of, and when I was a young man, I did, you know, that confused people and, screwed things up um and now i realize well in certain settings and to a certain degree those things can be practiced or you know enjoyed uh but they you know they're contextual does am i making sense yeah like like um like i like i i uh how do i want to say this so there are contexts in which wearing uh, a two-piece uh, bathing suit, uh, you know, uh, makes sense, but it's not in church. Mm-hmm. You, you know what I'm saying? On a, if, if you if someone wore you know their speedo to church, people would say contextually this is a little odd. Uh-huh. Granted, people wear speedos, but contextually this doesn't work, mm-hmm. right? It'd be shocking. It's not mm-hmm. shocking on a beach. It's contextually uh, appropriate, right? And of course, if you saw me in a speedo, it would be shocking. But I'm just saying, uh, there, there's, you, you know, in other words, and so when we look at our own personalities and how we move through the world, we just also have to think about context. Like where there are certain places and times things can be done, and there are other times that maybe we should not do that right now. Uh, and you know, let me, I'll give you an example as a four. As a four, I can be pretty self-absorbed. And as a young man, I was very self-absorbed. I could be very narcissistic as a young man. By the way, I still can be, but it's different, right? Hopefully I can spot it faster. The difference is also is that I know I am uh, versus, what, versus what was going on when I was 25, right? Um, and there are times, like if you came to me and you said, you know, Ian, I'm really struggling with depression and in this relationship with one of my kids, whatever, you know, you're really down. And I started talking about myself. That is contextually stupid. Right. So I I have enough emotional intelligence now to realize for the next hour, I'm not going to speak about myself. This is all about Kevin for the next hour. Uh, Kevin doesn't need to know. He didn't didn't come here to hear me talk about X. You know, he's here. So, now, in another context, if you and I were just sitting on the back porch drinking, you know, you were having a bourbon, I was watching, and then, we, you know, smoking cigars and watching the sunset, it'd be a whole different context. I could talk more out of my own experience. The conversation would be completely different. So I think emotional intelligence is also, as, as you said, reading the room. It's about reading the moment. What is happening right now? That's social awareness, I guess you could you could say, but I'm just... The ability to read the space and the context and to know what's going on here right now, uh, it's just, that's that's a really important part of what we're talking about too. All right, I'm going to end on a question for you in regards to, I hope that everybody listening to this series with Scott Allender on emotional intelligence also listened to the one I did that we did together, Ian, uh, here on the show. on. Emotional intelligence. And you can even say on the Enneagram, you know, so we go do the, we go take the Enneagram. We find out. So I find out I'm a seven. Okay. Here's my propensities. It's great. Uh, I'm looking at emotional intelligence. I'm kind of figuring out where I am there. If we, if you've got a client that you're working with and I say, okay, man, I want to get, I want to, I want to grow in these areas. I want to be able to wield my Enneagram well. Where do I take action? Where do you have me start? Where's a where's a first few steps that I can go beyond just hearing about it? I get it, makes sense. I got some knowledge. Now I want to learn it. Give us a direction. Yeah. Well, let me. I, I mentioned it, or I mentioned one thing earlier, and there are some non negotiables I have with guys. I, okay. I don't care who you are. If you're the you know you're the CEO of a company, or you know you, or you're a fourth grade school teacher, it doesn't matter to me. If you want to work with me, you have to make a commitment to a regular practice of meditation, period. It's almost like 
you know, if you if you won't do that, then I don't know. Ultimately, it's it, it, it's just going to slow the process down if you don't start to be self reflective. And because because Kevin, I just I got to say this to you. So we live in a culture that wants to take shortcuts all the time. Hmm. And part of that is this productivity, kooky, crazy side of productivity and, and it, it, you know, fixations. What I'm saying is in the spiritual and emotional life, there are no hacks. And I don't I don't care what, you know, Christian book you go out by that says here are the five steps to this. There are no five steps to this. Okay. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like there's just no hacks. And so you have to do the work and it is work. That's why, for example, in meditation, we call it a practice. It's something you have to do over and over and over again. Right. It's like, you know, scales on the piano. Right. You just got to keep going back and doing the basics. Another thing I'd say, and recently there was an article about a woman in The New York Times that, about this. You got to journal. Hmm. You have to start externalizing your thoughts and feelings and beginning to make observations. We know from research that journaling imprints things in our minds and in our experience that just thinking about them doesn't do. Right. So, you know, those are just a couple of things I do. You know, uh, no, and, that's that's good. If you've got time, I want to ask you two questions. I want to sure. clarify both of those. Can we do that? Yeah, real quick? Sure. Yeah, go for it. Um, give us. So, again, you got a newbie in front of you. Uh, or, or, or well, I'm not, um, I'm not an expert, but if you had a newbie who's looked at that and say, okay, meditation, that sounds great. There's like 15 different styles. Do I do it for a minute? Do I got to go for an hour? Do I need to, do I need to levitate? Do I what it, just give me a starter. So yeah. there are some great, there are some great books on it. Uh, I think if you're a person of faith, I'd recommend that you go read the Catholic monk, father, John Keating, Thomas Keating, who wrote a book called open heart, open mind. Uh, it's about centering prayer, which is sort of meditation in the more in the Christian tradition. If your listener is somebody who self identifies maybe more as a secular person, there are some other books out there. You might read even Dan Harris's book, Ten Percent Happier, might be yeah. an interesting book to read, uh, among others. And there, are, I, again, I, I would recommend to a secular person that they read, you know, the more what I would call the what are called secular Buddhists who really teach on mindfulness meditation, and they do it brilliantly actually. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, um, what I tell people all the time is we start at five minutes, you know, you don't, you don't train for a marathon on day one running 10 miles, you'll hurt yourself. Right. Mm -hmm. So the key is we started, we started at a half mile, quarter mile, and maybe we walk, you don't run for that first quarter mile. And then we just slowly work our way up. Right. So I, until we get to a, a more meaningful amount of time spent uh, on the cushion every day to keep our growing awareness, self-awareness and consciousness as we move through the world activated. Give us a goal time. 25 minutes. Okay. So that's, I, I can I just say, I don't know why that has been chosen, not by me, but by, by teachers I know as being, now I have gone on weekends, by the way, or week long. You're going to laugh when I tell you that. So I have gone on week long retreats, meditation retreats where it's, six and a half hours a day hmm. for seven days. Yeah. And you do six and a half, seven hours a day and there's no television. There's no iPhones. There's no, you don't, you don't read books. You don't take journal. You know, you know in other words, you're just there doing your work. Yeah. It's a very, it's an intensity kind of a boot camp that's, experience. That's but hard. Yeah. Five minutes a day you start. I didn't start doing that. Okay. So uh, yeah. We started five minutes a day and then we, you know, could be six weeks. You go to seven minutes. Yeah. You go to nine minutes. Just go at your pace. Okay. Same question, newbie question on journaling, because we can all whip a journal out and just say, well, I ate this today and I did this and this happened. And I don't think that's what you're talking about. So give, give a little more clarity on that. Yeah. Okay. So at the very least, every morning, get up and write three things that you're grateful for. Just three things, three sentences, three bullet points. If that's all you do to start your journaling experience, great. Be humble when you start. Don't think to yourself, oh, every time I sit down, I got to write 10 pages. I want you to sit down to start and write 150 words. Hmm. Now, you know, and I know that one printed book page in a book is 325 to, let's say, 350, 300 to 350 words. I ain't talking about a lot. I'm talking about like a paragraph. 
right? And and it, it might be just uh, talking about how you're feeling, what's going on. You know what I mean? Like you're just processing out loud. You're just throwing crap down. Don't worry about it. Just start. Now, right now, for example, with me, I um, so here's my journal, mm-hmm. right? Right here is uh, next to my couch uh, here in the. Box. I've been reading uh, Wisdom at Work. Uh, the Making of a Modern Elder by Chip Conley. And, you know, I underline stuff and then I go, oh, wow, that question, that that really moves me. And I sit down and that becomes the topic of my time in journaling. Hmm. Uh, and so, uh, or I may be on a, a roll on a particular topic um, and I'm, I'm journaling about that for a couple of weeks. Um, you know, I might be doing an inventory uh, in my 12-step work uh, or whatever, and that becomes my journal time. I, I just, I just, you, you know, writing things down, man, is so powerful for some reason. And I think scientific research shows that that's true. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing what you do personally and, and that with a, a book. Cause I feel, I hear some people are, they struggle to come sit down and put something down. I usually have a catalyst like a book and it's usually on an area that I am interested in personally. So I'm reading to learn and I'm sitting there with book in hand and journal in hand, sometimes handwritten journals. Sometimes I use, I do some in, um, what's it called? Evernote. I'll do some journaling in there. If I, especially if I'm going to do a lot of, I, I really want to, th- I want to write, I, I want to write faster um, I'll, or I can type faster when I write, but I'll do it there. But I do, I have a catalyst. So thanks for, for pointing that out. And this is, this is great. I feel like that's worth the weight of our, for, worth the price of admission just there, just getting to some action steps at the end. And this yeah. is, thank- so, so just one last thing. There's, yeah, yeah. Actually, there's actually a New York Times article people might check out. It's called the name of the, ti- the title of the article was what's all this about journaling? Uh, the subtopic, the subtitle is one of the more effective acts of self-care is also happily one of the cheapest. <laughs> so, uh, again, it's the New York Times. What's all this about journaling? Uh, and, uh, yeah, it's look at this. There's another one in here in the New York Times. Another article, how to keep a journal uh, is the name of the title. So, anyway, there's a lot of stuff out there that's available on the topic that could be super helpful to people. And, again, part of it is turning the gaze inward, not, not navel gazing, but turning the gaze inward to start to look at what's going on in there because that's so much of what emotional intelligence is. It's like, Oh, okay. Journaling, meditating, just watch what comes up, Kevin, in meditation. You'll learn a lot about what's going on in there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, your kooky thoughts. Ian, that's a joy. I could do this every week. Why don't we do that? Every week okay. we're going to talk about this stuff, and uh, it's just a gift. Thank you. I, yeah, it's so I, I'm excited. Um, I am uh, hopeful with it. I love the clarity. I appreciate you again uh, recommending Scott and both you guys your work with the Enneagram. I continue to get so much value out of it, though. That's why I asked that question at the end because I'm finding out just knowing it is not help it. Well, it helps me be aware but I'm having to work it out. So I'm having to, it's another journal topic is how am I working this out? So, and thank you for coming back with me and sharing your insight and your heart. It's just a gift. Thank you, Ian. Yeah, I love it. Thank you so much, Kevin. It's always rich. Well, this is part three in my series on emotional intelligence. My catalyst again, Scott Allender, author of the book, The Enneagram of Emotional Intelligence, A Journey to Personal and Professional Success, also host of the Evolving Leader podcast. And you just heard from Ian Morgan Cron, who I did a series with as well on the Enneagram. His latest book is The Story of You, and you can check out his top-ranked podcast as well called Typology. Friends, thank you for tuning into Self Helpful, where I curate the sea of new personal development materials and help you integrate wisdom into your life because we all want to elevate our own experience and improve the way we show up for others. 